All right. Well, um, the last talk of B-Sides, I'm presuming, um, it literally tells us the status of cybersecurity and our interest in children, right? In, in, in many ways, it's indicative of where we are when it comes to how we, are, we come to this idea of security, children, parenting. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of a background, uh, talk a little bit about who I am. Um, some of you know me, many others don't. Uh, I'm a cognitive behavioral scientist by training, okay? I spent um, close to a decade and a half of my life in cognitive behavioral science. I was a tenured professor. I wrote tons of papers um, on security, on children, on the human factors of security. Nobody read them. Um, yeah. It's the, uh, Lisa, thank you, and this is Lisa. Lisa Lisa's read it, so that's one. Um, I wrote a book, which is available at Black Hat right now at the Black Hat bookstore called The Weakest Link. Uh, some people read that. Uh, I did a lot of that. For 15 years of my career, you know, I spent a lot of my time doing fundamental research. Switched from there, in between, to a little bit more of what I like to think of as being a technologist in the public interest, okay? Uh, what I basically did was, I wrote in the media to draw attention to problems in security and to solutions. Um, wrote in CNN, wrote in Washington Post, wrote tons of it, starting 2014. I still do it, I just wrote something about CrowdStrike um, on uh, dark reading last week. Um, a lot of advocacy, right? A lot of problematizing, providing solutions. I was very early on, in 2014, I talked about how we have to orient towards securing the nation, right? Very often, when we think of cybersecurity, I, I speak at Black Hat, I've spoken at DEF CON, our focus in all of this tends to be on the organization. Seldom do we think about it as the family or the societal problems that are happening at the parent level, right? And cybersecurity, if you think about it almost a decade later from my original pieces, is a bigger problem and it's not just an organizational problem. If you have kids, and I do, uh, that brings me to you know, the third part of what I did, right? And that is, I have kids. Those aren't my kids, okay? That's a stock picture, that's not my wife. It's live streamed, I can't put up pictures. But what that got me to realizing, I have two kids, I have a son and a daughter. Um, uh, one's a Gen Alpha, she's 15. Uh, I, I mean, he's eight and my daughter is 15, so she's Gen Z. And that's when I eventually realized there was nothing to guide parents when it comes to how you secure stuff around your kids. How do you introduce technology to them? When do you introduce technology to them? So I founded a company called the Cyber Hygiene Academy meant to basically advocate cybersecurity training for children and for parents. Basically coming up with best practices because there really isn't much out there. It's surprising how confusing the landscape is when the stakes are really high. This brings us to some of the stakes, right? Uh, when it comes to Gen Z and Gen Alpha right now, they're using technology more than millennials did, more than Gen Xers did, more than every generation before that. They're using technology for education, they're using it for training, they're using it for entertainment. But there's something very interesting that's going on, right, with these groups, and that is there is a convergence of technology and an increase in agency that's happening. What do I mean by that? What I mean is, the so-called boundaries of platforms have all converged. What used to be social media, an entity in and of itself, is very hard to discern from YouTube when it's streaming content. So there's a lot of this convergence that we're starting to see across platforms, right? Uh, YouTube is almost no different than a, uh, with, with ads today. If you look at YouTube, it's no different than you know, a, a, a network a television network, but then it's also a social media, and it's also entertainment, and it's also gaming. It's, it's everything, it's music, it's they're throwing everything into this. And the agency that these kids have, today's kids have, these generations especially, are higher than the previous generation. A part of it is thin infrastructure, right? We have wireless technologies, we have battery-operated phones, you know, things that my generation uh, didn't have as much. We still had computers that were wireline. We had networks that were you know, dial-ups that we needed. These kids are growing up with it. 
So the amount of agency that they are used to is way higher, and we see some of the, down, the, the, the downsides of it. The stakes have gotten higher. For the first time, millennials have been reporting more data breaches than older generations. This was this year. The second interesting trend, which is kind of really bizarre, there is more personal information, like compromising, if you want to call it, for my generation, on devices that millennials have. Which means a data breach becomes extortion very quickly. Because there is that much image in there that you can use. Because it's become routine in many ways to have data that might be compromising in some way and not even think about it. And this particular orientation is something parents are having a hard time dealing with. So what parents are doing, though, is you know, we have data now. Um, and we got this data just to give you an idea of where we're getting all this data from. For one, there isn't a lot of good data on parents and on children. The best data we have found comes from studies by NIST, by NICE, National Institute of Cybersecurity Education. They're using samples of 20 parents, diets of 20 parents and 20 children. That's the extent of the data that they have. Good data, nevertheless, but very limited. So part of what we did is, you know, we did a 1,000 adult study. So we did 1,000 parents across the nation. Um, you know, we did two different surveys. Uh, one we used prolific. The other we did, you know, we also did about 100 one-on-one -on -one interviews with parents. We talked to school counselors. We talked to psychologists. We talked to teachers. We talked to school districts. It's an ongoing process that we've been doing to try to understand what is going on with this access that parents are giving, or how do they orient it. And one thing that became very clear is that parents make a distinction between computing technology like a computer and a smartphone. Right? And it makes sense, right? And why does it make sense? Because a smartphone basically gives the child more agency. They're by themselves, they can use it, they can move around. It reduces the amount of control the parent has, and it increases cybersecurity risk. All right? So in the surveys that we did, when we asked parents about you know, what do they think is a greater risk, it's no surprise that almost 40% felt the smartphone was kind of like that primary risk compared to a computer. Okay, and this has an implication as we go forward, right? This is the generation that's growing up with this technology that's basically, what it does is it influences when that parent gives the child a phone. So are there any parents in this room? Everybody, oh my gosh. What is the right age to give your child a smartphone? Why don't we ask the child in the room? What's the right age? What is the right age to get you a smartphone, like an iPhone? 12, 13. 12, 13. What do you think, parents? Anybody? Higher? 16. What else? That's OK. We got time. It depends on the child, what they're going to use it for, what kind of monitoring you have in place on the phone. I mean, there's so many factors at play. My kids got their phones at very different ages. What did, they, what did the oldest kid get the phone? What age? Um, I don't recall, but my oldest child has hearing loss and has hearing aids that can only be controlled from uh, mobile devices that have the correct app stores. Mm -hmm. So the oldest got a smartphone at a younger age than the younger one because um, it was gave her agency over her assistive technology, which is... Um, which is important. I'm going to come yeah. back to that. That's a great point. Yes. What age do you think is the right age? I would say... Same thing? Depends on the kid. Depends on the kid. Okay. Right. So when we ask parents this very question, a lot of people resonated exactly what you're saying here, right? Which is, the older the better. The median age is usually, they want them to be at least a freshman. Okay, or higher, 20% of the population said, 20% of the sample of respondents said never. College, they don't think they're ready. So this is a question that's really important, right? It gives you a glimpse of how parents think. But then there's another question we asked, which is the question I asked you, which is, when did you give your child a phone? And it's at fourth grade. 
and at fifth grade. So notice that disconnect that's there between what a parent really wants to do and what most of them end up doing. So why do they end up doing this? This is a question we've been, we try to answer, right? And the answers for this, one of it is peer pressure, right? The child wants the phone because all their friends do and that track phone, the gab phone, the restricted devices that the parent gives them no longer makes them connect with others. But the second thing that's happening is children become more active at middle school. Um, after school activities, sporting events, group activity, and the teachers, very importantly, in our system, stop communicating with the parents directly and start communicating with the child or online and expect you to go look at your scores. So almost that phone becomes a nece necessary device for the child. And so by, by fifth grade and by sixth grade, when you look at national statistics right now, by eighth grade, seventh and eighth grade, 86% of all kids have an iPhone or an Android phone, or have a smartphone with them. By high school, it's 98% in the country right now. That's the beginning of high school, the freshman year. Okay? So when parents don't have much in terms of choice, when they have to capitulate and lose that control that they have, the next thing they do is they become protective. Right? So they start saying, let's lock down this device, or let's figure out a way to control usage, okay? And this is something that we wanted to experience, explore further and say, okay, what is this control? Because we're trying to get to this understanding of how are parents protecting kids? What are they doing and what's that right thing to do? Is there a best practice that we can talk about and, and how do we in, involve ourselves? Parents don't allow children to use new apps, 80% of them. Most believe that limiting exposure, screen time, anything that they can do, protects them from cyber, protects the child from cyber threats. What's really interesting here, which is something we never thought would happen, we would see, is there is a socioeconomic divide that happens here. More educated, higher income parents, more educated, many of us in this room, tend to be more protective than parents who are lower income, lower SES. It makes sense, right? Why they're more aware, correct? I mean, it makes sense. They know, they hear, they read, they, they see what's going on. You know, they're more cued on to you know, what's happening in the media, the stories that you read. And this particular issue bleeds into a lot of other things. So one of the things we asked parents is, What's your perception of your knowledge? How well do you understand cybersecurity? How would you rate your cybersecurity, your ability to respond to attacks, right? This is a question that's very critical. It's an efficacy question. We're trying to understand, what does a parent think of their abilities? Parents rate their abilities very high, okay? And this particular question comes back in a couple of different ways. How do you rate your ability to educate your child? Again, very high. And here again, we see a socioeconomic divide. We see parents who are educated, parents who are higher income, who are way higher when it comes to this particular perception. Right? Makes sense. Parents who are they're more cued on, they're more educated. They think they know. But then do they really know is the question you've got to ask. Right? You're helping your child. Do you know what you're helping them do? How well do we understand security? This is an issue that if you read my book, we have been dealing with this for a long time. We have a measurement called the cyber risk index. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, the, the cyber risk belief measure. This is a measure. It's got about eight questions. It's available online, the questions. You can go to my website. It's there on it. We measure actual knowledge. And when we measure those, so, so there are questions. This is a true or false question. So a simple question would be, you know, what's more secure, um, SMS or WhatsApp? Right? It's a question everybody should know the answer to. What is more secure, SMS or WhatsApp? What is the answer? Anyone? WhatsApp, right? Why? It's encrypted, right? Uh, another question, right? Uh, what does SSL indicate? Does it mean a website is authentic? No, right? Most parents think it is. Nobody is the test. A thousand people took this. Nobody got 100. The mode was, the mode was 17. 17% was the average, the midpoint, around 30% was the average, 67 being the highest. And there was no socioeconomic difference. So, I'm sorry, that knowledge 
across the board is very low, but the perception of knowledge is very high in one group. And so one of the things we see here is what we call as a classic Dunning-Kruger effect, right? For those of you who know what this is, it's overconfidence or overrepresentation of self-knowledge, right? And when you have an overrepresentation of self-knowledge, you're overprotective because you think you know what you're doing. Right? So people with high self-knowledge, which tends to be high SES parents, are more protective and overprotective than the parents who are low SES, who are known who have a lower self-concept in general. And this perception is not driven by actual knowledge, it's driven by perceived knowledge. Okay? And this is really important. This, we can uh, package and unpack this for hours, but the point of this is smart parents are not that smart when it comes to cybersecurity, but they think they are. And that drives a level of protection, almost overprotection. So what do they know? Where is this information coming from? Right? Most of us are missing it. So when we looked to see the drivers of protectiveness, like where are these parents getting? So I don't know if you guys have read this book by Jonathan Hyatt called The Anxious Generation. It's a new book that just came out. Uh, new York Times did a very raving review of this. And the entire book's premise is that children should not have technology with them. And some of the things that, some of the reasons are things like cyberbullying and predation. Because it exposes them to cyberbullying, it exposes them to predation. Now, I've looked at, we've looked at research going back to even 2014, all the way to now. Sonia Livingston's work is a prime example of that. The incidence of cyberbullying is actually very low. However, the perception that it is very rampant is very high. And it's awful when it happens, there's no question about it. But the overall representation is actually way lower than it looks. The same goes for predation. It's, a, it's rarer than it looks. And predation, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, happens more when parents overprotect their kids and don't give them devices. Because the child sneaks behind their back and starts using a phone, it's unsupervised. So it's almost having the opposite effect. So the cases when we talk to counselors, they're always talking about girls in this particular case being overprotected, using devices with their friends, and then becoming victims of something going down that road. Right? So this is a, something we see quite often. Other things that seem to be happening is ideas like digital dementia. That, you know, Anxious Generation is the name of that book. There have been large-scale studies of 350,000 students, and there's no evidence of digital dementia. In fact, we see the opposite. And we'll talk about the, the, the positive effects of technology, which nobody seems to be talking about, right? Uh, other things, children being more sedentary. Sure, there are some children who become more sedentary if you're playing your PlayStation all day, but your smartphone can be a conduit for activity too. And the results of research that we have seen is pretty mixed. There's very low effect sizes. Fourth thing parents said, children become antisocial. There's absolutely no evidence for it. Fifth thing parents said, damage to brains, damage to the mind. I don't know if you, you know, I, I grew up when, when I was doing my dissertation, and you know, we were still looking at research on television effects. And if you looked at original, you know, 80s and 90s television stories, they said the same thing. They were just parents like me at that time. So I guess every parent goes through this evolution thinking it's gonna damage their child's brain, and it's not. It's not rewiring anybody. But that seems to be the governing principle. And so what, we were, what we're looking at is balancing the positive. Right? Uh, creativity, innovation, problem solving. I'll give you a very simple example. I talked to a child, um, a school counselor, who's telling me how this young kid who's nine years old collects Pokemon cards. And the cards are written, many of those, I don't know if you know enough about Pokemon, I know just enough. Apparently the Japanese cards have a lot of value. And he uses his phone to translate it. I wouldn't have thought of that. It's just creative problem solving. One of our advisors in Cyber Hygiene Academy, she's a 21 year old girl, whose parents allowed her to learn coding, very permissive parenting. She has a business that sells digital art on social media something she was using since she was like 14. So 
none of that effect is ever considered when everything is framed on the negative. Second thing, cognitive development, right? Uh, TV improves, you know, Sesame Street. Today, uh, my son, when I was teaching him, believe it or not, mathematical multiplication tables, I put him in front of YouTube because I was like, I can't do this. Watch this repeatedly. It works. It worked. We never talk about it because a lot of the framing is again negative. Social skills. A lot of dating happens online. With school counselors, with uh, psychologists, what we, some of the evidence that we're seeing, again, anecdotal data, boys who are not socialized on technology have a harder time, they're more maladaptive, they have adjustment issues when they go to college, they have dating issues when they go to college, and not having a device early on, whatever that early on phase is, restricts all of that. Stress reduction, anxiety reduction, health requirements, right? If you have a learning disability, if you have a hearing requirement, if you have health issues, health monitoring, all, I'm sorry, all of these things from physical activity, mapping your run, working out, happens on devices. So one of the things that we're talked about, we're talking about, is that this idea of banning phones, which is what Jonathan Hayrit talks about, doesn't make any sense. If anything, there's no research that suggests you should do it. And if anything, doing it has a counterproductive effect on the development of the child. And yet, if you go online, this is what people are talking about. There are long form pieces advocating this principle. And I don't know if you recently followed, you know, um, I think the Vivek Murthy, the the guy who's the Surgeon General of the United States, asked to put warning labels on social media. Uh, for one, warning labels on social media are going to make people more maladaptive in their use. And unlike cigarettes, which has a clear negative impact, there are positive impacts to social media, and a warning label takes the agency away from the parent and throws it on back to the social media company. Okay? And so we think that the, the, the solution to this is building a healthier relationship, right? Which is cyber hygiene development. This is something you know, I wrote about, advocated, starting in 2014. And to date, the only state in the entire United States that's got any level of mandated cybersecurity education on children, where they introduce technology and security to them at a young age, is North Dakota. And next year, apparently in North Dakota now, they want it such that every child who graduates has to have taken at least one cybersecurity class. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but up until 1960, if you graduated from Harvard, you needed to know how to swim. Swimming was a requirement. I don't know if anybody knew that. And it stopped after you know, the ADA came out back in the 1970s and 80s. But this is cybersecurity today. It's an essential skill. It's a requirement. It's something we all live with and that these kids are going to all live in. And so when we talk about permissive parenting, parents need evidence-based education, right? Parents don't have any evidence. Me as a parent, I'm still looking for evidence to say what's the best thing to do. And the easy thing to do is to stop and pull back on the technology. The easy thing to do is to frame it on the negative and scare them out of it. And then they go around our back and start using technology. Okay? So, that's all I got. Questions? Anybody have a question? Lisa. The microphone is coming around. If you raise your hand, I'll bring you the mic and. Okay. Thanks, Arun. You know I'm a big fan. Um, what do you think CCSD, the fifth largest district, I know you've done some research and some writing about them, so I'm sure you know they're going back to school next week and they will have all of their cell phones in um, RFID pouches. Right. Um, these are not locking and the students will have them on their person, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that and as parents um, who may be in this community or one that, that does that, like, you know, what do we do? I know, <laughs> and, and just to, you know, frame that in a bigger way, uh, Florida has banned smartphones in, in schools. Uh, New York has 
New York, the New York Senate has a bill right now, the governor's got a bill, where she wants to do the exact same thing. Kids need phones. Some kids need them. Other kids should have them. And the reason for it is, today the phone is the, the parent connects with the child purely on the phone. If you have a school shooting, rarely enough when it does happen though, that's the only conduit for calling them. Putting phones in RFID and putting them away basically takes away any connection that the parent has with the child, right? So I think that the, the entire thing, we're taking the easy way out. And the easy way is to just ban everything. And if you ban it, if you've seen what prohibition does, everything just goes on the ground. It's worse. It's gonna make this situation worse because we need to embrace the technology as against trying to restrict parents from using it or children from using it. And parents then say, well, you know, you can't use a phone anyway, so let's not give them a phone. To come, I, I don't know if the debate is over restricting tech to kids. I think it's more about what's the right age to give technology to kids. Um, and when you talk about schools and banning it in schools, I you know there have you seen evidence one way or another of test scores going up in schools when they ban it? Um, and I guess if you could that's, that's a great question. Yeah, if you could tease out maybe more reasons why you think kids need school, uh, phones in schools? Right, I, um, to date, I, I guess this, this banning yeah. is a new phenomenon that's happening, right? There is nothing to say that it's more intrusive yet. So the school districts I have spoken to, nobody is finding it incredibly intrusive. They just don't want the kid to be in the classroom using the phone. They want it to be in, you know, put away. That's about what the teachers are asking for. But the school districts are making this decision saying, well, it's, you know, we can't just do it for some kids and allow others. We're just gonna ban the whole thing. To the other question, which is what's the right age? The right age is actually middle school, okay? All the data points to middle school as being the right age. And, and the reason middle school is the right age, it's when they're also starting to break out of, into multiple social networks. And one of the fears that, that all of us, myself including as a parent has, is a lot of the middle school kids if you don't train them into using the phone smartly, wisely, they start creating social media accounts because they go behind your back and start making them. And those social media accounts are on the phones of friends of theirs. It's the worst case scenario. So giving them phones and not having them learn the blind, learning from the blind is the best way to do it. And so middle school is the appropriate age. And if you notice, the data tends towards that. That's basically when most parents do it. What's missing though, and the big gap there, is there's no fundamental education of any form yet at the school level that's approaching it. The other issue with banning phones, and this is a critical issue that nobody thinks about, the schools don't want to deal with phones. They hand your child a, a Chromebook and they say, well, that's my responsibility. That phone is your responsibility. So by banning it, it's now the parent's problem. So all they're doing is they're locking down that Chromebook and they're teaching them everything on the Chromebook. There's really nothing on that phone. That's you as a parent and as you can tell, most parents don't know how to deal with it. They don't have the knowledge to be able to effectively teach safe use. This is where the schools have to step in. And this is what we're pushing for, which is don't ban the phone, instead be more permissive and train them how to use it. Because they're gonna spend their life using it. There's no way you're not. Yes. Uh, I'm curious on your thoughts on the idea of restricting screen time. So if you give a child in middle school access to a phone, um, are they using it as much as uh, like a graduate or something like that? Right. Or is well, there an idea of like structuring the time in a particular way or what's your opinion uh, on that? What, again, this is based on the data we have, right? This is coming from school counselors and psychologists. Screen time is something a parent needs to negotiate with a child. It's, a, it's an important part of that cyber hygiene training. You know what I mean? As against having a parent mandate and dictate it based on their perceptions of screen time, having a, 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 a defined best practice for a parent to follow makes it easy. Right now when we talk to parents, everybody has a different idea of how much screen time is permissible. Some say, well, four hours, well, what's screen time if you're learning multiplication tables on YouTube, on your phone? Is one hour enough, right? And so that negotiation becomes very tricky because we have no best practice out there to give to parents. 
And this is one of those areas where there is, by banning it and putting our hands up and saying it's not our problem, we just punted that problem to a parent, and everybody's trying to figure it out themselves. So part of what we're trying to push for is this, is this understanding that cybersecurity is not just an organizational problem. Parents are dealing with it too. And our job is to not just educate employees so they secure the organization's perimeter better, but it's to help the parent because that's that next generation of your employee coming in there. Don't forget, most of the kids right now have already been subject to some data breach. All my kids have been subject to multiple data breaches. The difference is they are clueless about it. So they're walking out into college with all their data compromised, whether they like it or not, and with no training, with no education, with nothing protecting them or preparing them. That's, we just punted that to an organization and say, well, go take care of it. And we know how well security awareness education works. So I think you know, fixing this, and we're, I've been talking about this since 2014, fixing this at the societal level is more important. It's, it's kind of like a primary duty that we have because technology is not going away. It's just getting bigger. Any other thoughts? Any other questions? Yes, Lisa. So switching out of our parents' hat and putting our cybersecurity professionals' hat back on, just back to the school thing, it's curious to me, um, you know, cyberbullying is a massive issue, and there's, you know, it's against the rules, and in some cases, it's against the law, uh, but there's nobody to enforce it. There's nobody to investigate it, there, so it's just not happening, and it's occurred to me that by locking the phone devices that that puts the cyberbullying back on the people on and the parent. parents and away from the school. That's right. Is that, yes. that's probably and, and the incidence of cyberbullying, you know, there's there are gender breakouts. There's a lot of data that we have that we can talk about, but it just basically pushes it onto the parent and the school says, well, it's not our problem, it's not our device. So it's back to you as a parent. And the same thing happens with, you know, sextortion issues. Remember, you know, there's a thin line between sexually explicit image sharing and sextortion. Kids who are sharing sexually explicit Im images on a phone, they need to know what the best practice, what they need to do to stop that from happening because you go to your teacher, she's a mandated reporter. You're gonna start a chain reaction that the parent is now gonna have to come to deal with because it was on their device. Parents who I've talked to who have faced this have gone through hell. And there's nothing out there in data terms that tells us anything about how they're dealing with it. So, so when you start talking to parents and actually kind of untangling what they're going through with cyberbullying, with extortion, with just being, and, and boys with sexually explicit image sharing, which they think is very funny because four kids are starting to share images, there are consequences to it. And there's nobody teaching people what kids, what to do at, an, at any educational system. Private schools are not doing it, public schools don't have the resources to do it, okay? And so, what we're trying to advocate for is very important. You know? And when you start speaking to parents, you see, you see everybody says, well, it's not my child, it's not my child. It's like the Mike Tyson rule, right? Everybody says it's someone else's kid till you get punched in your face. Then you realize what it's, what, how, how crazy it can get. Any other thoughts? All right, take it away. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for coming. It's the last talk of B-Side, so. Thank you for coming.